as you have seen nucleic acid programmable protein arrays or NAPA is very robust technology where many applications can be performed. You have seen Dr. Josh Leber discussing about the advent of this technology and various type of applications which could be performed on these arrays. However, the nature of microarray experiments are such that you have to perform series of strips before you can make any meaningful signal or the sense out of the data. It is like a western blot when starting from blocking your arrays to doing the incubation with the patient samples or primary antibody followed by again washing strips then secondary antibody incubation and then do the signal detection. So, this whole procedure which is the day long procedure involves series of washing strips drying and again adding the next set of reagents. Imagine that you know you have printed some features on the arrays some substrate could be glass or nitrocellulose and as the day progresses and you are uh, performing next set of experiments on these chips then if the reagents are not very tightly bound to the substrate they may slightly wash off or if your binding is not very tight then probably you will see the loss of the signal. To overcome these technology barriers there is need to come up with better alternatives and the technology progression has to happen so that we have more robust microarray platforms available. In this slide Professor Josh Leber is today going to introduce you to a newer method which is Halotag based NAPA technology which they have very recently developed it has shown much more promise and very strong signals to do the NAPA arrays with much more efficiently. So, let us welcome Dr. Josh Leber for today's lecture on advent of NAPA technologies using Halotag methods. Okay, so um, what I thought we would do today because you're, you are all such advanced uh, uh, scientists in the area of NAPA is fast forward a little bit. So, we have talked a lot about the development of the technology, we have talked about the methods for making it, we have talked about some of the applications that we have done with it. What I thought we would talk about today are some of the newer methods that we have been developing in the last year or two. So, these are very current in fact several of them are papers that were published just this last year. So, one of the things I mentioned the other day was the halo tag and this is what um, the halo tag looks like. Um, this is a chloroalkane. So, it is a it is a it is a it is a aliphatic chain with a chloride at the end. You can also do the same thing with bromoalkanes, but um, chloroalkane is a, is a I think a, one of the preferred substrates. And um, this the halo tag enzyme is a suicide enzyme. So, it, it binds to the chloride it forms a covalent attachment to the chloride and then it gets stuck and so now you have this protein that is covalently attached to this chloroalkane. And this R group here can be any functional group that you want and so you can use that to attach the chloroalkane to any surface you can attach it to beads um, you can uh, uh, attach it to a DNA barcode. And, um, and that means that, that if you add the halo if you add this part to your protein just the way you would add the GST protein now your protein will stick to any of those places covalently you will capture it in a, in a one directional method that is permanent. This is this could be potentially very useful. So, one application is that uh, I think I have emphasized several times that, that the NAPA technology primarily displays proteins that are functional and folded and, and for the most part we believe that that is a uh, advantage of the technology, but there may be circumstances in which you want to measure binding to denatured protein. Perhaps the epitope you want to find is actually a linear epitope and it is buried inside the protein. So, if you were to try to denature standard NAPA what would happen? So, how does NAPA hold the protein on the array? GST and and antigen antibody. So, what happens when you denature antigen antibody? They, they fall apart right. So, if you take standard NAPA and put it under denaturing conditions the proteins on standard NAPA will all fall off 
because they're being held there by a strong but nonetheless non covalent interaction. So imagine now if you could attach the protein to the array in a in a covalent attachment. Now you could treat it with with you could you could denature it and the proteins would still stay attached right. And so that's what's shown on this slide. Um, so we we uh, we made an array and these are with proteins that all have the halo tag on them. So this is just like the kind of Napa that you've seen before, but the difference is that in this case instead of using the GST tag, we have a halo tag and it's binding to the the ligand. Uh, and now you can see um, for example, uh, this is a P53 antibody and um, uh, the GST tag, um, so uh, this is the protein array under standard conditions, this is the protein array under denatured conditions. When I say denatured I mean we treated it at 55 degrees Celsius with SDS. So that's a pretty harsh treatment and you can see that um, the GST antibody only binds to folded NAPA, it does not bind to denatured NAPA, but this particular uh, anti P53 antibody could bind both formats. Because we knew this antibody, bind, uh, this antibody here, binds to a uh, uh, linear epitope, and so one of the ideas that um, Ryan had, uh, the student who did this work, was: Is it possible that if you were to take a protein array and display it against serum, either in the native format or the denatured format, would you get different immune responses? Could you pick up responses? for example under denatured conditions and that's what he actually found here. Here you see um, uh, the denatured uh, protein and then here you see the um, uh, under standard conditions and here you can see that uh, this, this antibody here specifically detects um, yeah under standard conditions and whereas these two antibodies only detect cyclin A and MYC under denatured conditions. So that patient's serum response was different depending on whether they were folded or whether they were not folded proteins. I think you can see that response here that it's binding, this is this response here binding to the denatured protein uh, whereas you don't see it so strong um, in this guy here. Okay, any questions on that part? Okay, so then. No, 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 no. The array was denatured. Then, then all the, the, then it was washed and then treated with physiological. So the proteins were all stretched out on the array surface. You denature the array, then you rinse off the SDS, you rinse and you bring it back to room temperature, and now you added folded antibody. Because if you denatured the antibody, it wouldn't work. Or most antibodies don't work. Okay. All right. So, um, we talked about this a little bit earlier in the course. Um, this issue of uh, some, a couple people asked the question about protein diffusion. And, and so what, what, what do I mean by protein diffusion? Well, here are three spots on the array, kind of in a, car, in a cartoon. Uh, and here you see the DNA for each of these genes. And um, one of the concerns would be that if you produce the red protein, that the red protein could float over and bind in the spot where the blue protein is supposed to be. Same could be true over here on the green side. So you get mostly red bind to red, but maybe red binds here, maybe blue binds over here. And so you end up with a circumstance where you have a little bit of mixture at each of these spots. And so that would be, that's the concern that a lot of people have. So we, we actually um, went to see if how, how much of a problem that actually was. So this is the this is a, a, a configuration of our standard NAPA. The spacing here between these spots is what we currently print at. And what we did in this experiment was we printed uh, the gene here at this spot. And in these spots here we printed everything but the gene. So the antibody is still there to capture the GST, but there's no gene in that local position. So what that means is that if there's any diffusion from here to here, it'll get captured by those sites and you'll see that as signal, okay? And, and what you see is that in fact, there's a little bit of spread around the spot, but it doesn't really reach over to these neighboring spots. 
and this is a three dimensional plot of that intensity. So, very strong intensity at the main feature almost no signal at the neighboring area. So, in standard Napa this is really not a big problem ok, but if you start to make Napa much smaller. So, if you take the 750 micron spacing here and make it 375 spacing. So, almost cut it in half yeah. So, now these spots are really close by now you start to see a little bit of signal bleed over you see that little green signal. So, this is the intensity of the spot itself and then these neighboring spots have picked up a little bit of the protein and you can sort of see that in that in that 3D rendering. So, <coughs> so what that tells us is that for the most part under our current conditions we are ok, but if we ever wanted to make our arrays much much more dense. So, shift from 2300 proteins let us say to 10,000 proteins we could run into trouble where there would be neighboring spot intensity. So, we have been thinking about ways to get around that and, and this is the method that we have developed. Um, what we do is we take silicon the same material that you use to make computer chips and we use the same technical approach that they use what is called photolithography whereby shining light on the surface you create a mask and then you etch it with um, chemical compounds that etch away the surface and you, you essentially can wear away the surface of the silicon and you end up what we do is we create these little what we call them nano wells um, nano nano because they are nanometers in size. In fact, in terms of fluid volume they hold picoliters of liquid. So, they are very very small and we so we etch away those wells. So, here this is the process you use photolithography to kind of create a mask you use um, the acid etching to create these wells um, and then uh, they there is a couple of chemical treatments you have and then we print the Napa mix into the wells. So, uh, it it is while I describe it like it was easy this is actually quite an involved process to get this to work. Uh, it took a lot of different um, uh, mapping methods on the on the photolithography side to create wells that had this sort of bowl shape at the bottom because typically photolithography wants to make a straight wall and a flat bottom and it turns out that the signal intensity was not as good in that format. Uh, the other thing that is not tricky that that is not easy is printing the DNA into the well. So, in standard Napa we just have a solid pin printer that just runs along and just makes spots, but here we had to get the liquid right into a much smaller target and so, we ended up having to use a piezoelectric printer that um, has a camera in line with the print head and by using the camera to align where the spots are we can aim the sp it spits the liquid into the tiny wells uh, and it does so quite accurately, but it is a little bit tedious, uh, but anyway that that is what we do. So, you end up printing the DNA in the well, then once you do that you add cell free lysate across the entire surface of the array and that liquid in, is intended to get into the wells and then you cover it with a cover slip and you can see that cover slip right there. Um, that also turns out to be non trivial, non trivial because when you have small wells uh, like that there is a tendency for the liquid because it is hydrophilic to not want to go into the wells um, because air gets captured it, it basically it, there is air in the wells and it gets captured. And so, you have to fiddle a little bit with with vacuum pressure and surface pressure to get the air out and get an even distribution of the expression lysate throughout the wells um, and actually the solution that um, the engineer came up with is quite clever. I will show you that in a moment. I just want to mention this is what uh, this is a scanning electron micrograph of these nano wells in silicon and you can see that they have this very nice bowl shape and it turns out that that shape is important ok. So, what what Peter did to seal these wells he developed a system where he had two plastic laminate surfaces that flat plastic surfaces that are like this and sandwiched in the middle he has uh, a form of oil a liquid a liquid oil a clear liquid oil and so then what he does the liquid oil that whole system is connected up to a pressurized system and so the minute we finish putting in the expression lysate he adds pressure to the the oil 
the oil then takes the plastic and does that. It kind of forces it apart and essentially forces the plastic to seal the, the nano wells. And it does so instantly uh, and at the same time there's they apply a little bit of vacuum to the liquid on the, the surface of the array that pulls out any excess expression lysate and you end up with a sealed surface um, where you um, I don't know if you can quite see that, but you end up sealing the silicon well, uh, the nano wells with that, with a plastic surface. So this is what the apparatus looks like. Um, it, there's, it's, it's evolved and I need to get a better picture of that. This is a little bit of an old slide, but um, the system works pretty well. This is the piezoelectric printer, by the way, that's doing the printing and these are these piezo, these special piezoelectric nozzles that are very accurate at delivering fixed volumes to each well. One, one added benefit for those of you who are Napa aficionados is that with these nano wells we have figured out a way to print the print mix separate from the DNA mix. So what, what, one of the things that you may not appreciate when we norm, normal Napa when we print it has a cross-linking agent in it and the crossing agent is meant to capture the DNA and the, and the protein BSA to the surface of the slide so it stays put. Um, the problem with the, the cross-linking agent is that it's, it's, there's a time function attached to it. The minute you activate the cross-linking agent, it, it's a free chemistry that starts to act on your sample and if you let it go too long, everything gets over cross-linked and it's no longer functional. So the minute you add it to your print mix, the clock starts and you have a certain amount of time to print it before everything gets ruined. Anything that doesn't get printed that day, whatever's left in your tube, it's gone forever. So if you made a lot of DNA to print your arrays, use a little bit of it to print your arrays, all the rest of your DNA is lost. And remember, I, I mentioned the other day that even though it's not expensive to make DNA, whenever you have to make 10,000 of anything, it's expensive. So now you've essentially wasted all of your 10,000 DNAs. One of the advantages of this platform is that we can print the DNA separate from the print mix, which means that we don't add the cross-linking agent to the DNA when we print it, which means that whatever DNA is left over, you can freeze it and use it another day. And so you don't have to waste everything that you've used. So that, that turns out to be an advantage to us. Okay, so this is what um, this looks like. Here we've dispensed genes into nano wells. Uh, the genes are in this pattern where they're separated by wells that don't have any expression. And you can see how accurately it expresses. You get very clean expression at each spot and despite the fact that these are very close together, you're seeing no intervening spots, right? This is if you were to just express it without um, sealing the well. So if you just, remember I said we seal the wells with the plastic. If you left the plastic unpressurized, now, every, now you see how much spreading there is. So this is the tendency to spread and this is how well the sealing apparatus prevents the spread. So it essentially blocks it out completely. And so that's how we got this image here. So what you're looking at here is now a NAP array that has 10,000 features on it. Um, all expressed in nano wells. This is the, the DNA print. This is the protein print. And then we stained it with an antibody to one specific protein that we repeated on the array. And you can see how sharp that is. Single spot, single spot, no diffusion to any of the neighboring spots. And if you plot that in a 3D image, you can see it's just exactly where you want the signal to be. Okay, one of the added benefits of this approach that we did not appreciate when we first developed it is that it turns out to be more sensitive than standard NAPA. So we did some comparisons and we looked at um, uh, this, this antigen VP1 and we're doing different dilutions of antibody to ask um, what, what's the detection limit on the array platform. This is standard NAPA. And then this is um, HD NAPA. We call that high density NAPA. And you can see that, you know, at every, pretty much every dilution, we're getting much better detection here than we are here. In fact, you know, it kind of plateaus here at, um, you know, maybe 50 or 60 at, at 1 to 300 dilution. At 1 to 300 on this platform, it's 450. So the signal intensity is much stronger on these high density NAPA arrays. Yeah, so this is EBNA up here, this is VP1 down here. So these are two different antigens and you can see that the, the uh, signal intensity by dilution is much better for the HD than this. We even compared the um, HD NAPA to ELISA. So you would think that ELISA being a, 
a full scale chemical method in a, in a 96 well tube should be much better in expression, but in fact um, we were able to detect signals here uh, on the HD Napa that you could not detect at all on the ELISA and then overall the signal intensity by ELISA compared to signal intensity by HD Napa this was nowhere near as strong as that was. So it it in our lab right now this is probably the most sensitive platform we have for detecting interactions. This is just to kind of uh, assure you that we can print these arrays very reproducibly because that's one of the things that you want to be able to do. So um, I don't know if you can see this in this light, but um, this is a, a single slide array that has four sub arrays on it. Each of these sub arrays contains 4,000 different spots. So we have um, 4,000, 4,000, so you, a total of 16,000 spots on this slide. And, um, and we've repeated it uh, in one batch or in a separate batch. And, and then what we've done is we've done an interaction map, you know, the kind of correlation coefficients that I've been showing you throughout the course. Uh, every day versus every other day. And again, as you can see, um, uh, everything here is in the, you know, close to 1.0 and in the certainly above 95 percent in terms of its reproducibility. So it's every bit as reproducible this platform as the, the standard Napa was. And then this is probably more relevant to you all is if you actually, that was for protein expression. This is now asking if I screen the array with antibodies or serum, will the answer I get from array to array from batch to batch be the same? And um, again, I don't think you can, can you see the spots there? It's a little too, too dark I think. Um, but this is the correlation graph and again you can see that um, nearly everything is in the high 90 percent if not 1.0. So this, the results you get align very nicely. Uh, and so that led us to this picture here. So this was the, we made the cover of Journal of Proteome Research that month. Um, uh, and what I'll, I'll show you this image again. Uh, what you're looking at here, let me see if I can go here. Hopefully you can appreciate that there's a tiger um, in that image. So this is a, the, what you're looking at is an actual protein array. Uh, we've printed different amounts of DNA encoding the P53 protein. We then express the P53 protein in the array in these nano wells and then probe the array with anti-P53 antibody uh, with a fluorescent tag on it. And what you end up seeing is because of the different amounts of DNA you can get an image of the, the tiger's face. So this was the first time we ever did an image using a protein array. All right, so now, um, all right, so I want to move on to a, a slightly different topic then. Uh, this is um, another way about getting a lot of information onto the array. So imagine, uh, e, you know, the whole goal here is we want to we test as many proteins as we can when we, when we screen an array. In the current NAPA format on plain glass slides, which is what most people can use, because all the technology I just showed you is kind of fancy and you have to have special instruments to do it. Most people would rather work on a plain glass slide the way you have. The problem is in our current platform we can only put about 2300 proteins on that slide. But that limitation is only true if at each spot you only have one protein. But what if you put more than one protein at each spot? So maybe, maybe what do you all think? Could that work? What would be the issues? So the idea here, one of these ideas that came to me in the shower <laughs> is, is that we could print multiple genes at each spot. So what would be the issues? Why would you not want to do that? So tell me what you mean by the specificity of the binding. Say, say it again. Okay, um, not that's not, that that wasn't exactly what I was worried about. What what do other people think? Say, say it again. Okay, so tell me what you mean by quantitation. Okay, all right. So that's the, so, so what? So she's saying 
how are you going to understand the individual contributions? And I think that that's a fair concern, right? So I've got, let's, let's say I put three proteins in the spot, right? Now, now, in the same spot, all three proteins will be there. If I get a signal, I won't know which of those three proteins was the target, right? I, I won't be sure, yeah. Will all of them have what? The same tag, yeah, yeah. They'll all be they'll all be captured by the GST tag. That's the idea. Yeah, one could imagine a much more sophisticated version of this, where you had three sets of proteins with different tags. Um, that would be an elaborate method, but it, potentially one that could work for sure. Right. So, but nonetheless, so that could be an issue. So here was my reasoning when when the idea occurred to me. So, um, whenever I do an experiment on Napa and I screen an array of thousands of proteins and I get hits, the first thing I do after I get those results is I repeat them, right? I want to make sure that if my array told me that the antibody bound to protein X, that if I really try it again with another protein X, it still works, right? So I'm, I believe that all scientists are obliged to repeat their experiments to make sure that they're correct. So I, it occurred to me that if I did the experiment with a multiplexed spot that had multiple proteins, I was going to repeat it anyway. But this time, instead of repeating them as mixed, I could repeat them as individual proteins. And so I would be confirming that they were binding, but at the same time I would be identifying which spot was the one that contributed to the signal. So I would get sort of two benefits for one in the second round experiment. And the net effect would be that I could screen many more proteins on a single slide and then um, in the end do much less work to get the same information. So, um, so one of the questions we had, now that strategy has limitations to it, right? It, uh, one of the assumptions of that strategy is that when you screen the array the first time, that the fraction of proteins on the array that will be detected is small. Right? Uh, because if the fraction of the proteins on the array is high, then the whole time savings thing goes out the window. Now why is that? What do you think? So imagine now I have an array that has, we'll, we'll make a simplified array. It has a hundred spots on the array and each of the spots on the array has five proteins in it. Okay? If, if I screen the array, and I get two spots that light up. How many possible targets do I have? Ten possible targets, right? So my next day, when I go to verify, I have to, I have to do ten different spots and then I, and I'll have done my job. All right, now, let's go to the other extreme. Let's imagine for that hundred spot array that ninety-five spots light up. How many potential targets do I have? 95 times 5, right? And so how many spots am I going to have to do the next day? Pr pretty much as if I had started with, you know, five arrays, each one with one spot each. So I'm back to doing the same job I would have done if I had not multiplexed. So the multiplex idea works when the, tar when the hit rate is low and it doesn't work so well when the hit rate's high. And so you can actually mathematically evaluate what's the best or most optimal number of spots to mix based on the likelihood of a, of a hit rate, okay? And so we actually did that. We did the, developed the equations and we actually looked at it. I'm not going to go through the math. Um, we first, we looked at, we looked at the frequency of, uh, of hit rates for different types of studies that were published in the literature. So the first question we asked was, on average, if you're doing a protein interaction study, if you're doing a, uh, an autoantibody study, of all the targets that people study in their, when they do their experiments, what fraction of proteins light up? And so this, that's what this is. This is the percent of identified hits. And you can see that this is the 5% mark right here. And most of the protein function studies and, well, I would say all the protein function studies and most of the autoantibody studies are down in the a couple percent range. Certainly they're less than 5%. So that's promising, right? That means that this strategy could be a big time saver if I can make this strategy work, right? Okay, so then the question was, 
what's the optimum number of spots we can do? Maybe making the assumption that the hit rate is 5 percent. Even though I think that's probably a little high for most of them, I think it's a fair assumption. Um, it, it, you know, the, it's a more conservative estimate. If we can satisfy that one, we're certainly going to take care of everything that's lower than that. And so we did, we did the math, and this is um, the optimum number of genes per spot. And you can sort of see that, that um, you get more and more savings up until you get to about five spots per gene, after which it doesn't really get better. And then it gets worse again uh, because of the whole problem of having to do too many duplicates the next day. And so the sweet spot here was around five, five genes per spot, right, right there. And th this purple line is the, um, or this green line here is the 5 percent. See that 5 percent there? That's the 5 percent line. That it came out to about 5. These guys are also pretty good at 5. Um, when you get up to here, when you get up to 10, 15, 20 percent response rates, you need maybe to question whether the strategy is a good one for you. Does that make sense? And so the idea here then is you could take on a standard Napa now that has 2300 spots or 25, let's say for the, for the sake of argument we can do 2500 spots, you could print the entire 10,000 open reading frames on one slide doing five proteins per spot and that's what these different colors are meant to indicate, five different proteins per spot. Then you would, you would screen that and you, let's say you get these five hits, one, two, three, four, five. You take each of these five hits, that's 25 possibilities. You print a second array that has the 25 hits on it and you screen that the next day and that does two things for you. It tells you which of those five proteins was a hit and it, it confirms that it was a hit. It tells you for sure, yeah, that was real. Uh, and so that's, and so that's, that would be the strategy. Does, does that make sense? So you're, we call that the deconvolution step. Uh, it's sort of verification stage and deconvolution stage. Okay, so does it work? So what would be an experiment to make sure that it's working. So one, one of the questions that comes up is if I put five spots, five protein genes in a spot, will they all make protein? What if only one makes protein and the other four don't? Now we already know from Napa, other, other Napa experiments that every, mo, almost every gene we print makes protein. So we, we're confident about that piece. Uh, but you could imagine that somehow mixing them on the spot could be a problem, right? So how would you test that? You could look at, the, you could look at that if you, if, the problem is that for most proteins we don't have the functionality. What other ideas we got? You could certainly test them one by one in the mix, in the mix. That's, that's how we went about it, right? So what we did is we said, well, let's make mixtures of proteins for which we have antibodies. So in this case, we're testing only proteins that we can come back and test. And then we're going to ask the question, if I mix a bunch of proteins together, um, if I test it, will I find the protein? Now, is there a, are there features that we need to consider um, where um, one, let's, if I have a mixture of proteins, where one might be made in a greater quantity than another? What, what kinds of things would I want to think about? Where could a bias come in? So if, I, if I have a protein that's 15 kilodaltons and a protein that's 80 kilodaltons, would I see a difference? What do you think? Why might I see a difference? So, right. So how, how, do, how do proteins get made? Right. They get made by adding one amino acid after another using tRNAs on the ribosome, right? So the, the amount of amino acids you have to add to get to 15 kilodaltons is a lot shorter than the amino acids you have to add to get to 80 kilodaltons, right? And so you could imagine that if you have proteins of different sizes in the same spot, that the small protein could get churned out a lot faster than the big protein. And you might have a bias from that. So we tested that too because we want to make sure that the, the method was going to work. Okay. All right. So here, here what you have is, um, uh, it's a little, let me walk you through this experiment. Um, on the top where it says M, that stands for mixed NAPA or multiplex NAPA, 
we, we printed a mixture of five genes and then expressed them. And then we also on the same slide separately printed each of those spots individually. Okay? And then what we did is we probed, we probed that array with an antibody that recognized one of the proteins in the five and asked even though it was expressed in the mixture did we detect it and did we detect it as well as we did in the mixture as we did by individual. Okay? And you can see for this IA2 protein we detected it in the mix, we detected it much better as a single spot. So to some extent this protein did not do as well in this group as it did there, but it was still we could still measure it. So we, we wouldn't have missed that in a study. Here's another one GAD2, we, got, we, get, uh, we can detect it in the mix, we can see it as a single protein. Um, here's anti P53, it turns out that the mix was even better than the single protein was. Uh, here's anti FOSS, you can see that the mix was about the same as the, the, mic, the individual spots. And here's, uh, un, I can't read that, SFI, SFN, um, and again you can see that they're, they're comparable. That showed us that the system was basically working. Now in this top experiment, we tried to restrict the study to proteins of similar size. So these are, these are all uh, are around 100 kilodaltons, uh, these are around 60 kilodaltons, these are around 50. You can see that they're different, they're roughly different sizes. So we, we tried to group the proteins by similar size to avoid that problem I described earlier. But then Chabot who did this work decided what the heck, let's just see what happens if we mix them randomly. You know, is it a problem? And he did that down here. So these are, these, this is 100 kilodaltons, here's 23 kilodaltons, and yet we still detected this one even, um, even though these other, even though these guys are much smaller than that one. So even though they were smaller, they, they didn't seem to inhibit. Uh, same, same is true here, this guy is um, 65 kilodaltons, it's with a much bigger protein than some smaller proteins. Uh, and so in every case we're able to detect the protein either in the mix or by itself. And so that gave us a lot of confidence and, and these are just some of the data, he did mu much more of it, but it gives you the idea that you know if you mix the proteins you can still detect individual proteins in the mix. You still have the issue of having to figure out which one is which, but, but um, that will come later. <coughs> so um, we, we decided to try to print a whole array and this is um, the, the array we printed and we wanted to make sure that the array was reproducible. So you guys have seen this plot over and over again, but we do this on every experiment so I have to show it to you because I want you to get in the, get used to the idea that part of the job of doing these sorts of studies is doing the quality control because the experiments only work if you do the quality control. All right, so um, this is the array printed with DNA, this is the array made with protein and this is doing, um, uh, uh, comparing the DNA from different arrays and then comparing the protein levels from different arrays uh, just to show that they're, they're reliable. I'm, I'm just going to tell you briefly, this is a group of proteins up here printed as a mixed array. So that is what we call multiplexed NAPA. So each of these spots here contains five proteins apiece. The same proteins that are here are down here as individual proteins. So this was an experiment that we set up so that we could compare how did single individual proteins express compared to the mixed protein expressed, right? Because we're still trying to test the notion that the mixed NAPA will, the multiplex NAPA will give us the same result that we were looking for. Oh yeah. Yes, yeah, we added roughly the same amount of DNA for each one. Um, uh, what? Okay, we, yeah, you, you, there's a limit to how much DNA you can print. Um, and so I, I think what we did is we took the normal concentration and cut it by four and then mixed that five times. So it was a, the overall concentration was about 25 percent higher than normal. Uh, but it was roughly the same as what we normal print, but this time it was made up of five different genes. I mean, if we uh, put more of DNA for the small size protein, Yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, so technically if you look at this, if you look at the, the, you know, the molarity of the different DNAs, that there's 
technically more moles of the smaller genes. Um, it was too complicated to figure that all out and adjust for that and Shabo wasn't willing to do it even though I suggested it. So, so um, but it te seemed to work okay. Mixing, um, so the idea was you know if, I, and I don't remember exactly what our, our final print concentration is these days. I think it's like two or three hundred. Um, but uh, we, they, he, they took the standard concentration and cut it by one to one fourth and then mixed, uh, mixed that together with the other guys and then uh, and actually what happens is if you just, if you just mix 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1, right, then each one of those becomes one fifth of the concentration, right, and then you, and the overall concentration is still the same if they're all at the same concentration. So that's in fact how he did it. All right, it's a good question though. Well, that's an interesting question. In, in, in normal biology, that would make sense. Keep in mind that remember here, there are no UTRs. All of these genes have been cloned into an expression vector. They all have identical upstream regions. They're, they're, yeah, it's a T7 polymerase. Yeah, so it's a different circumstance, but that's a good point for standard biology, yep. Today's lecture you have learned that how using a very strong covalent bonding chemistry involving halotax base NAPA you can now perform high density piezo printing and the assay quality and reproducibility tremendously improved by incorporating these newer methods. And that is really a good lesson for all of us to really see that you know a technology can be started but there is a need to improvise it further and bring in the new creative elements so the technology can be much more reproducible and can also serve the much sensitive assays on the same surface. In this light, the thought of improvising NAPA for the high density printing as well as much more strong and robust binding was really accomplished by incorporating these new creative methods. These concepts will be continued and discussed in the next lecture. Thank you.